Thanks, Marion. So I'm actually co-opting an extra three minutes, actually probably more like four, because I want to show a, a video that was taken by one of our grantees that I think puts a very good context on the whole of this, both from a sanitation and a water perspective and an exposure risk pathway perspective for those people in the disease area. I will talk over this because there's some things I want to point out. So this is a Kenyan manual pit emptying. This is a pit emptying crew uh, that was filmed when we were trying to look at what actually happens. So they're going into a compound here, about 120 people with one toilet. That is the fresh water line. For those people in water service area, we'll get back to that in a second. And now you're going to empty the toilet. You can see that there's no way you can get anything like a device down there, so it's being done by hand manually. No personal protective equipment, one exposure pathway. You'll also notice the, the way they're removing it with that stick, the stick's about a meter deep. That latrine is probably three meters deep. So they're only putting out the top liquid part. They're not going to pull out the accumulated solids at the bottom. Cost this, uh, this toilet would probably cost about 60 US dollars to empty. I normally try and play this over lunchtime. So, but I, I made sure there was sound as well. You've got to get the sloppy noises. So as he walks through, what I want you to look for is at the bottom of one of the buckets, a lump of shit will fall off. And it's low. And pretty much, there it goes. And that's fallen off in the area where the kids play barefooted. So for those folks in the NTD and ID arena, you know what that means. Now they're walking right past that fresh water pipe. Okay. So you see exposures there. This is their uh, transportation. The one thing that they did for, because we were videoing is they covered it. They normally use this without covering it. So this is the protective system because we were videoing this. And the reason why I tell you that is as they walk down the streets, these look pretty big. You could get a vacuum truck up there perhaps, but you'll see the streets start to narrow. They get a lot bumpier. And if you imagine this was uncovered, you'd see shit slopping everywhere. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to use nice language when I present. So you can see how that cover for us, normally you'd just see a lot of shit flying around as they move. So another exposure pop up. And these guys are taking off to their treatment site. So they enter the treatment site. treated. <laughs> okay, I'll stop it there, but they pan round. Here we go, real quick. And you see people working in the river. So I just want to put that up there because I think it really opens up the context of the sanitation side, the water side, and the exposure side for the diseases. And it shows you what we're dealing with. So I'm looking at the foundation. We're looking at fecal sludge management, and we're looking at infectious diseases. We've put together a working group uh, specifically based on STHs. The good thing about a conference like this, I can skip through a bunch of these slides because uh, most of the folks know about it. And I'm sure the, the presentations will be shared for those people that don't. And as I was listening to all the other speakers, I was rapidly adding more slides to the presentation, so I've got to make that up. 
The approach of our, what are now called the NID group, the Non-Infectious Diseases Group, was to look at what is the priorities in their portfolio at the foundation. And when you look at, uh, does this work? Yeah, great. And I apologize, I'm not even going to try and pronounce them. I, I'm, a, I'm a sanitation guy. But when you look at the STHs, uh, so I'll say like uh, a trick, and we've got Ascaris here, and uh, Schisto's now been added, but they were focusing on hookworm. Uh, they don't look very significant compared to their top-level HPV, so those three. When you actually combine them together, though, they become the next dominant cause of the DALIs. So that's why the NID group actually just started a 10-year, uh, no, sorry, a five-year program with a 50 million into that five-year program to specifically look at how to break transmission. And they've got a set of partners, a lot of people here, I saw Dubai Cares was mentioned up on the board, I know uh, Water Aid's here, that will help with the implementation if they can prove that this is a good approach to take. From their breaking transmission approach, and again, it's always dangerous for someone to try and talk somebody else's strategy, but I'm, so I'm, I'm gonna breeze over this. Julie Jacobson and her, uh, her contact details are in the program, is the person to really talk about this. The breaking transmission strategy comes from the initial modeling that they've done. And their initial modeling says if we maintain the current coverage, we're not really going to do much for STH transmission. If we can actually look at mass dose administration and scale that up moving into the adult population as well as improving the access into the child population, we start to see that come downwards, but we still don't break transmission. So what we're doing at the foundation, we're looking at innovative MDA strategies, but also how do we deal with that vector control using sanitation? So we, can, we know there's more to it. Ag, the ag group's involved. Uh, nutrition's involved. It, it's a very healthy group. And I think at the conference that Marianne mentioned in Seattle, I couldn't make it to her. I was out the country that day. Uh, she's probably the people that were there saw that there was this collection of the, the foundation is starting to understand this approach or what's needed in this approach. Now I'm going to talk about breaking sanitation necessarily because this diagram's been up many times, but the ultimate goal for sanitation is reduction of the exposure pathways when it comes to these diseases. That's really what it comes down to. So I added this slide while I was listening because I think it's very important for people to understand at a very basic level, sanitation is the removal of pathogens. It's a removal of contaminants and it's a removal, reduction of the BOD. If you don't get those, you're not doing sanitation. You're just moving one problem to another place. So we have to make sure we're hitting all three of those. And often we don't think about pathogens apart from E. coli or stuff like that over here because we don't see in Europe, the UK or America, we don't see typically a transmission issue with intestinal worms. So we don't think about that sort of pathogen. We in the WASH team at the foundation look at the sanitation service chain. We regard it as effectively capture or containment. We have to empty it. We have to take it somewhere and treat it. We can collapse all that, which is the sort of very well branded, but people don't understand it's actually only about 10% of our funding, but very well branded reinvent the toilet program where it's all about containment on site. So we're collapsing this whole chain into one place so we reduce the exposure pathways. But if you can't do that, you have to treat either these are, each of these areas as a potential exposure risk with the pathogens. The other thing that when we look at, everybody um, with the MGD goals was really focused on containment. And containment looks really good when you see open defecation as the only problem. This is for Dhaka in Senegal. In the program, there's a similar diagram for Dhaka in Bangladesh, different city, obviously. Senegal actually has a very good collection system that goes to treatment. And the one in the program will show you that 98% or 97% past open defecation eventually ends up in the environment anyway. This one, we see that collection, that improved collection system as being good and we get up to 31%. But because we safely empty something, it doesn't mean that it gets safely dumped. And because we have a wastewater treatment plant with a sewer system, if it's not effectively kept up to speed, we may get leakage, we may get breakdown of that plant. So you end up with still 69% of the fecal sludge going into the environment. So one of the things on the WASH team that we're pushing for these post-20 millennium goals on sanitation is fecal sludge management across the whole chain, not just containment. 
So why soil transmitted helminths are important to us? When we look at our reinvent the toilet, we look at our exposure pathways. One of our fundamental specifications at the very beginning of the program was no pathogens. And when you look at the pathogen elimination systems, and it's sort of, you know, there's a diagram here that a few grantees use. If we look at Ascaris, we can get zero pathogens if we're up at like 70 degrees. We're in a safe zone there. We've killed most pathogens. Typically, we're looking about three days at 55 is what you'll hear for soil transmitted helminth like Ascaris. But the bottom line is, soil transmitted helminths, they're very, they've got this really tough, most of you guys know this better than me, tough protein layer. It's really hard to get into. If you can kill the soil transmitted helminths, you can pretty much get rid of your bacterias. You can get rid of your protozoas. We're not going to talk about regrowth at the moment. Okay, this is about sanitation and, and helminth. But you can get, you nail that pathogen, you can pretty much be assumed that you've removed the rest of them. Someone was telling me the other day, cryptosporidium is now becoming chlorine resistant. So keep that in mind. So if we're talking about 55 degrees and we're talking about, you know, three days or something, how does that fit into some of our grantees? Well, uh, I'm going to point out in a minute, Lou Watt, Lou Watt, can you stick your hand up down here? They came, good for them. We're looking at systems which have got desiccation, composting, and biogas in them. Now, at the end of the day, all of them have to demonstrate that there are zero pathogens. In the case of the Aerosan, use, uh, the Aerosan unit here, which is being looked at by our emergency program, um, and people like UNICEF, you've got a large black tower here. This causes passive air movement through essentially a desiccation box where you defecate into. If you can get that down to about 80% moisture, sorry, 20% moisture content, you start to, I lost off my screen, you start to actually inactivate the helminth. You know, if you can get it lower, even better. Over here, let's see, down on this one, here. This is effectively, it's an auger based composting system. And it's mechanized because if you want to compost, you're going to have to aerate, you have to turn it. Everyone thinks composting is simple. It's actually very labor intensive and you're gonna to have to teach a family to compost for the rest of their life, and they're probably gonna pass it off onto their kid because no one wants to turn their own shit around. So you have to make sure that the composting system works. This has an auger. It has a vented auger and a sealed auger in the component in it. You'll defecate into the system. You kick a bike pedal on the side, which is geared. It dumps into a certain amount of uh, sawdust, and then it moves slowly down this auger over a period of three months, and it's dumped out at the end. It's specifically for a family use. These things are on their, uh, at the moment, they're on their fourth model in Ecuador, and they're starting to move some testing out into India. Um, and they're, they're really trying to deal with this situation. But the problem here is that there is no a way to understand if they have dealt with helmets. Where they're working in Ecuador doesn't have a helmet issue. So they're composting, it's great but they're not looking at the helmets at the moment. If we go up to a Duke biogas system here, so we've got a household biogas system goes into a heat exchanger. They're sipping biogas off to heat up the effluent to sterilize the effluent before it leaves. So now we're starting to get into these areas of what people call simple technology, but they have a very neat purpose behind them. And then we go down to the Luwatt here, and I'm not gonna to explain too much about it because it's better to explain things about someone else's technology when they're not looking at you. But effectively with Luwatt is when you flush, it's not a water flush, it's a plastic sheath flush. And it encapsulates your feces and your waste. And then after, I think it's what, seven days? You'll collect? Yeah, once or twice a week. Okay. And you collect this sausage of shit from your family. And then they take it away and they process it at a biogas plant and they take those biosolids and they compost it. Now, the key here is that you've closed that exposure pathway from moving that from one place to another, and then your biogas, uh, you're processing it with biogas. And we'll have a conversation tomorrow about the thermophilic biogas systems uh, to make sure that they're actually eliminating the pathogens. So we saw manual emptying. This is another guy. He's actually going right down. He's been paid to empty a pit right to the bottom of it. And it's actually a line pit. It's a nice pit here. So one of the other things we're looking at is how do we actually stop this exposure to all the pathogens? We have a pumping unit that can pump you know, pretty much around uh, 50 liters per minute. It can remove about 40% total solids in a system. 
What we want to do is be able to bring it up into a pit side processing unit, say about, could be 50 or 90 meters away, which then can remove the water and the sand. We can effectively remove the trash. By removing the water, if you can get it to about 12% solids, you can now get four meter cubic meters, right, or along the lines of four, septic, uh, four pits onto a truck rather than one, and 80% of the cost of emptying a pit is diesel, is transportation. So if you get more on them, it's better. And that's why these guys just drive around the corner and dump it, because it's cheaper for them. So the question here, though, is how do we do that at a price that competes with the manual pit emptiers? And also, how do we bring the manual pit emptiers into the process so they don't lose their job? So there's a whole advocacy education component. There's a whole business modeling. I'm not going to go into all of that. I don't have time. But as I said, the big key here is getting rid of that water to make it cost effective to move the material and making sure that everything is sealed so you don't get the pathogen exposure. Oh, this one actually has animation in it, good. Lethbury University, I know we have a colleague of Sohail's here. So if we're not looking at composting where we're inactivating and we're not quite sure if we've inactivated them or not, the next best thing is to just use the big sledgehammer by cracking the egg. So you throw in enough energy into a system you're gonna combust or degrade or break up those helminth. And that's what these next two things are around. This unit here, which is uh, coming out of Lethbury University, is essentially a pressure cooker. It's a continuous flow pressure cooker. And it processes about 10 to 50 people's waste a day. This one here is about the size of a, a double file cabinet. And that's on the way, I think either is in China at the moment, it's on the way to China for infield testing with some colleagues they have out there. The next model is targeted towards about the size of a bathroom cabinet. Now, because it's essentially a pipe that's heated and pressurized, the size that it is is pretty much a linear relationship to the cost. So the bathroom cabinet size at the moment for bill of materials and production is estimated to be about 185 bucks. So now you can start to see how some of this technology, you get rid of a lot of the instrumentation, the, the complexities that you need to make sure it's working and processing. You make a very simple unit, you put it into an environment, and you can start processing material. Here with the hydrothermal carbonization, you destroy pretty much everything that's organic in there and turn it into a biochar. The next unit here, much bigger, is aimed towards neighborhood scale processing. So where someone like Luwap may go and collect the material, or Sanergy may go collect the material company out of um, Kenya, this will take about 7 to 15 tons of fecal waste per day, and it will produce a continuous 150 to 300 kilowatts. So about every seven tons is about 150 kilowatts continuous. Parasitic load on it is around about 20 kilowatts. So you've got a net positive 130 kilowatts being produced from your shit. That becomes very important, not from the fact that you may stick it in the neighborhood and have to build up a service option, that's great. But if you look at countries like Dakar and Senegal where they have wastewater treatment plants, at the end of their primary, they go to drying beds. And those drying beds are full of material that's still are loaded with helmet over and that gets used as a fertilizer. You take one of these, you stick it out there, you can now process that, you've got the dryness you need, and you can process that into power that can help run the treatment plant. We've got another much smaller, cheaper unit that actually uh, uses a Stirling engine cycle to degrade the fecal waste into biochar. That's actually on route at the moment to Kenya to, another, to a company called Sanergy, where they are collecting, I think they just went up to, they just built a facility for 15 tons a day of fecal sludge, and the whole goal there, again, by turning it into biochar, you do have a valuable byproduct, but the key is you are getting rid of the pathogens. From this, one of the things that my colleague Julie Jacobson loves the idea of is we're sending all of this stuff out into the field for field testing. So we get to play with a lot of poop. Right? And we have people like Luwat over there that play with a lot of poop, and Sanergy who play with a lot of poop, and Fontes and Terrace with the auger that play with a lot of poop. That gives us the potential to do a lot of sampling. And so the initial potential field testing sites we've got at the moment, and these are not the existing grantees like Luwat who are out in Madagascar, but the ones we're looking at for these larger scale equipments that are taking big consolidated loads. Senegal, you can see the list there. So we're also looking at Helminth analysis for constant techniques. I think I moved that to, so, and I'll talk about this first. It's much easier to determine, determine soil transmitted helminths in clinical samples than it is in environmental wastewater samples. So in an environmental sample with the clinical, both systems are labor intensive, both require a long shipping time to get them to the location for analysis. 
They require very highly qualified expertise people to do the spotting under the microscope. The equipment and consumables are not available in poor cities. But because of the personal component to it and the slow sample throughput, you get very low accuracy and precision on the sample. So what we're looking at doing is taking a network, and we'll start off with just a few. Perhaps we've got some University of, uh, um, in Mexico, we've got uh, some play, Imi down in, in Ghana we'll be talking to, uh, over in uh, University of Kwasazulu Natal over in Durban, and uh, we're looking for a lab at the moment in India to get them to agree on a set of helmet techniques, standard techniques, so that when data can be passed, it's not so long shipping that you have to send it back to the US or the UK or to Europe, but you can send them locally they can analyze them, and if they agree on a set of techniques, the data becomes ultimately be more comparable. But also, as you build these techniques up and you redo more sampling, and these guys that are going to the field will have to do those sampling, we're going to build up 12 months, 18 months of data. And the reason why we're interested in that is we're also looking at new analysis techniques. And we want to be able to bring them in and validate them relatively quickly, and for that we need consistent data that we know is pretty much unified. So here down in uh, uh, one of the Mexico, it's the University of National, or I can't remember, anyway, it's Blanca's group, down in the, one of the Mexico City universities, UNAM. What they're doing is image recognition. They're taking the person out of the equation. So instead of taking, say, one hour or three hours for samples, it takes about 10 minutes. Okay? And you're not training people up. So bro, cost comes down to about $2 US per analysis. That means a faster throughput, that means more sampling, that means better data, more accuracy, more precision. That should be, I believe that that'll be available openly uh, August next year. They had US dollars of 800 in here. They're gonna put it out openly to the academic population um, around August next year. And oh yeah, and they're currently actually looking for samples for anyone that wants to help them validate the system. So if you've got a bunch of uh, environmental wastewater fecal sludge samples, feel free to send them to Mexico. I just saw a <laughs> smile over there. The other one that's interesting is coming out of Caltech, and this is pathogen de detection on a chip. So lab on a chip type of stuff, my, uh, flow cytology. What they're doing here is they're actually doing quick PCR. They're using photo, uh, well, photolysis to tag it. Um, and they're doing all of this off-grid in a unit that uses PV to power it, and they actually use the sunlight to do the photolysis on the tagging. They then do the digital extraction, they do the extraction from it, they plate it out, they take a picture with a smartphone or they have a, basically a telemetry app on it that sends the plate image up to the cloud that does the identification. And the big key about this, uh, if I put the, the note on there, the current alpha prototype that they've got, and they're using it at the moment on bacteria, is about $1,000 a kit, but it's a prototype. The production target we're aiming for with them is about $100 a kit. So the chip also defines this chip that slots into the superstructure of the analytic equipment, and it's about the size of this box, will define the pathogen you're targeting. So you can also use it for multiple different pathogens. You're just swapping your plate in and out depending on what you're aiming for. Our polio guys are very interested in this. Our TB guys are very interested in this. The HIV guys are starting to look at this. So you can take this out to the field for about 100 bucks, and in 90 minutes you can get an analysis, not just in, uh, on the bacteria, not just on whether it's, vi you know, whether it's viable, but also how much is there in a quantitative manner. In the helmet, it's a little bit more difficult. There's going to be sampling statistics that they have to take into account, but they can, at the moment, they've shown they can determine between viable, non-viable helmet, live or dead helmet, and they can also determine through protein structures, and it's all, you know, different, you know, it's not me, so I can't explain exactly how, but they can determine between the different helmets, obviously. So in summary, we've got current preliminary models indicate that the transmission can be broken. MDA has to be expanded into the adult population, and effectively, sanitation techniques that go into play have to eliminate the pathogens, the STHs in this case. Fecal waste has to be monitored, managed beyond capture. It's not good enough to just say we can stick it in a pretty hole and we can build pretty holes bigger. You have to do something with it, and you have to make sure that that's killing the pathogens. 
The methods to determine inactivation are required. Better methods. At the moment, you've got to send those samples out. It takes too long. It costs too much. So it's possible to eliminate pathogens by complete destruction. That does add a very complex component to it, which can be solved, in our opinion, by a good business model, as long to satisfy the nature of the systems. But it does create more complexity. And, and I believe Ms. Vellerman talked about the complexity of trying to bring all of this together. So you know, we recognize that. And the other thing is that the more people implement controlled processing of fecal sludge, and this is what I really want to drive home to the, the NTD crowd, the more things we do out there to process fecal sludge, the more opportunities there are to actually track the issue. You've just got to engage those people that are processing. You've got to give them the opportunity to sample because there's an interest there for it. And if you can do that, then we'll start to see the data come in that gives us a much better context of what's going on and more recent. There's a lot of data, for example, in Durban, but it's perhaps 15 years old at the moment. So that's, that's my bottom message on this at the end. Thank you. <laughs>